this morning from this subject, God's truth concerning the benefits of the justified. God's truth concerning the benefit. The benefits, there are many, many of the justified. Bless us, Lord, as we preach this word on this communion Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. God's truth concerning the benefits of the justified. Today's message is sent to you from the God of the Bible to remind us of the benefits that we walk in and that we have as a result of being people who have been justified. I'm going to say in the onset of this message, many times the devil tries to promote the idea or the mindset, or the point of view, that somehow the effects of Christianity on the Christian are negative. People say, I don't want to get saved because I don't want to give up my good times. And sometimes we treat being saved and coming to church and living a Christian life as though we're doing God a favor to be here and that we are the prize. Look at me. I'm serving the Lord. I'm a young man serving Jesus, we often say. Oh, I'm a young lady in the church. I could be anywhere else doing anything with my life I'm, but look at me, instead of all the things that I could be doing, I'm in the church serving the Lord. Man, I, I could be at the club, but I'm in church. Oh, I could be running women, women, women. I could have boys, boys, boys. I could be having a ball, but you know, I'm mature and I'm smart. And I'm going to do, I'm going to forego all that stuff. So I can serve the Lord. Let, let me tell you something. In my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, um, the truth is, he, and, and this is true about your relationship also, he, the Lord Jesus, in saving me, he got the short end of the stick. The big, big, big winner in my relationship with Christ is me. And the big winner in your relationship with Christ, so you don't even know how to even respond to that, is you. Because we got him. All he got was us. All he got, Mother Turner, out the deal was Patrick Wood. I created no heaven and no earth. I didn't make any moon or stars. I am sinful. I was stained with sin. Hell bound. Oh my. I had nothing that I could offer him. What about your gifts and talents? He gave them to me. What about your abilities? He gave me them. And whatever I've been able to do since I met him, he did that. So 
What all of us need to understand, I'm coming out the blocks too fast, is that whoo, it is a blessing. It is a privilege. It is not a chore. It is not a drudgery. It is not uh, a ball and chain um, uh, to be a Christian. But it is a privilege, the highest of honors, to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And when I got saved, what salvation did for me and what salvation has done for you, whether you know it or not, salvation has given us endless advantages and benefits. See, oh, this is different because what we're normally hearing, you know, I gave my life to the Lord and it seemed like it's Going downhill ever since. No, no, no. It may seem like that. It, it was going downhill before you met the Lord. And if you really, if you really want to see downhill, while you're going downhill, if you really want to see downhill, let Jesus go. So you don't know downhill. Just, 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 just turn the Lord loose and say, you know what? I'm going with the lost life. I'm going for the world. I'm going for the gusto. I don't have but one life here and I'm going to live it. Forgetting all about the fact that you're living to live again. So, uh, and so you decide that you, you need, that, that, that you need to, uh, that serving the Lord would kind of slow you down. I'm here today to preach and let you know that there are benefits in serving the Lord. And you got to talk about it. The Bible says in Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his all, forget not all his Benefits. See, if the benefits, if the devil can just get you to forget the benefits, well, 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 well. he may get you to give up too soon. Most people who backslide, they're, they're one day away from their breakthrough. They're, had had, had Aaron just held up for just one more day, it, it, was, it was day... 39, if he just would have been a leader for one more day, Moses would have returned with the Ten Commandments. And the blessings of God would have been on them. But the leader came. Bible says, says for, uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, and with all, all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his Benefits, that is, all his advantages. Who, number one, forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. Who redeemed thy life from destruction. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercy. Who satisfied thy mouth with good things. Gives you good food to eat so that your health, your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses and his acts to the children of men. The Bible says the Lord is merciful and gracious. Thank you, Lord. Slow to anger. Thank you, Lord. And look at this. Plenteous in mercy. What a mighty God we serve. Verse 12 says, as far, well, let me read verse 10. It says, he have not dealt with us after our sins. Everybody sitting in here ought to thank God for that. Everybody in here ought to thank God for that. 
Because there's not a person in here who don't thank God uh, that they got away. That not everybody knows the most pious, holy person in here who is not a three-year-old has something. A chapter, a paragraph, maybe you forgot, but somebody remembers something that you wouldn't want known publicly. Something that God could have condemned you to hell for. Something that we could be lost for. And the Lord says, I'm not going to deal with you. What you talking about? According to your sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. That's why when you ask a person how you're doing, the proper answer from everybody ought to be better than I should. Better than I deserve. Because he has not dealt with us according to our iniquities. Somebody asked me one time, says, uh, what about all this weather, these storms and things? What do you think about all these storms? I answer, I said, I'm surprised we don't have, we don't have them every day. As wicked as man is, as wicked as says that we're having a hundred year storm that they're, they're occurring with greater frequency now. When the Bible said that would happen, number one, but it's, it's kind of God to let it take a hundred years. Because most of the time between the 100, for the, the, in, in the hundred years, uh, look at how people lie, cheat, steal, backslide, won't go to church, won't serve the Lord, man does what he wants. And then the Lord sends something. And he gets people's attention. Amen. Look at this. For as high, for as the heavens is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them. Thank you, Lord, that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us like as a father pitieth his children so the Lord pitieth them that fear him what a mighty God we serve let me preach to you a few minutes I want to talk to you about uh, just a few things I, I want to talk to you about um, justification and what it means and talk to you about how we are justified and who the justifier is. And lastly, we're going to close with the benefits of justification. And then we're going home. The prophet Isaiah said this about Jesus Christ. He referred, Christ is referred to here in this particular passage of scripture that I'm going to call you to, as God's righteous servant. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 11 speaks of Christ. He says, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant, look at this, justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify, everybody say justify, justify, justify many. To justify is to to clear one's self. Or, in this case, to be made clear. To justify is to cleanse. To justify is to declare righteous. It is to make righteous. Everybody say justify. Our justification as believers is the result 
that is assured by Christ's resurrection. There could be no justification. It'll get clearer in just a moment. If Christ would have remained in the tomb. We wouldn't be justified if Jesus would have stayed dead. See, this justification deals with the Lord taking our place. Deals with the expiation of our sins. To expiate is when you expiate, you, you pay the price. You, 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 you settle the differences. You make an amends to expiate. If, if I'm out of something, and uh, Brother Amanchuku expiates on behalf of of the person who took what I wanted, that means he did what was necessary to satisfy me. So therefore, that individual is no longer in my crosshairs. Matter of fact, his, his act uh, brought peace between me and the individual who had crossed me. Jesus is the expiator. He did something to bring peace between the Lord and us. Are you following me? Praise the Lord. The apostle Paul said this in Galatians 3 and 8. He says, and the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying in thee shall all nations be blessed. The, the scriptures foresee that God wanted to provide a plan that would cause as many people as who wanted to be justified. To be justified, God said way back, way back in Abraham, he said, in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The scripture that Paul was referencing here is Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. God says, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse him that curseth thee. And look at this, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. What I want you to pay attention to is that even from the beginning, Genesis 12 and 3, God had all human beings in mind. He didn't just want to save the Jew, but he wanted to use the Jew to win the world. For he wanted all the nations of the earth to be justified. See, when Jesus came and died on the cross, when Christ came, that was not God's plan B. See, God of the, the God of the Bible didn't have a plan B. See, if you need a plan B, you're not perfect. God don't have a fallback plan. From day one, he had determined. And he said in Abraham, in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And see, Jesus was a descendant of Abraham. Praise the Lord. Called the son of David, the root of Abraham. Stone hewed out the mountain. God's meek and humble lamb. From day one, God had a plan. After man fell in the garden to make peace between fallen humanity and the creator of all things. See, the creator is righteous. He's perfectly righteous. Someone said one time that God could have been any kind of God he would have wanted to be, he chose to be holy. That's noble sounding, but it's not true. God cannot be unholy. He is holy. He is the fount of holiness. If the potential to be unholy was in him, then he would not be perfect. See, as humans, we can be good, and we can be evil. On our best behavior, we have the ability to demonstrate worse behavior. Right. 
But God is good. Most of the time people say, and, and uh, I understand it, you just cut God short. When I tell you God is good, folks say all the time, God was good before he created time. And God will be good when time shall be no more. So then God is good. Don't limit his goodness to time because you might be going through something one day and run out of time. But you still need his goodness. God is good. Praise the Lord. Have you ever run out of time? I have. The deadline came and went and the Lord still made a way. God is good. Are you following me? Justification then is innocence based our innocence. Our being made clean. Our being made uh, clear. Our being declared righteousness based on what Christ did on the cross. And God subsequently raising Jesus from the dead. Oh, this won't set well with a lot of holiness, folk. But we're not justified because of what we did. Somebody said, I got saved and, and I gave up this, I gave up that, I quit doing this, that, and the other. That's how I know I'm saved. No, you're justified because of what Jesus did on the cross. Amen. Now, now once you get justified, once you, once you get declared righteous, once you get stamped righteous, now you want to live like who you are. You want to, you want to, you want to, if God have declared you righteous, you're, you, you want to be righteous. You don't want to be confused like these people. Man walking around calling himself a woman. A woman calling herself a man. Calling themselves trans this and trans that. Their minds are messed up. You ought, you ought to want to be who and what God made you. The Lord justified us. Say amen. Let's, let me show you something. And I'm going to preach to you in just a moment. Romans chapter number 3. And I want to begin reading uh, at the 19th verse. Let's see what the Bible says here. It says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. The law of Moses, the law was given mainly to the Jewish race. The Gentiles of the world had not heard the law, had not received the law, and unless they came in contact with a Jew, they didn't know that the law existed. So the law uh, what, what thing soever the law saith, it saith to them that were under, that are under the law. That every mouth may be stopped. Now watch this though. And all the world become guilty before God. The law was given to demonstrate the sinfulness of the human race. And it was designed to silence all mankind under conviction. See, this is why you can't do away with the, the, the do's and the, and the don'ts and the thou shalt and the thou shalt not. See, the world today wants to, want to, you know, cause us to adopt a way of thinking to where we think nothing is sin. But the law, the Bible shows us that there are certain behaviors that are sinful. And you be, be careful how you replace uh, biblical terms with worldly terms. We were talking, I was talking to someone last night, and they were talking about a preacher and some wicked things that were going on. And the person said, this person is crazy. This is all craziness. I said, no, he's not crazy. He's not crazy. That's not what the Bible calls it. The Bible calls it sin. The Bible calls it wickedness. Not crazy wickedness. See, we're, we're replacing terms. We're putting terms where they shouldn't be. The new standard now is okay. Well, I'm okay with this. And I think it's okay to do this. I think it's okay to do that. The question is, is it right? In the eyes of the law. Is it biblical? Does the Bible support it? What does okay mean? 
that's too benign. You can't, you can't put a finger on that. I, well, I think it's okay if a person can, a person can, can date, who, marry, love who they love, do what they want to do, smoke marijuana, uh, drink whatever they want to drink. That's okay with me. It may be okay with you, but the question is, is it right in the eyes of the Lord? That brings you back. I love somebody, I'm in love with somebody I'm not married to, and I'm okay with that. Well, does the Bible say that those affections are right? You all not saying anything to me. So the question is, is it right with God? Not, not okay. What does okay mean? Our families are falling apart because, well, our family is dysfunctional. Dysfunction nor function is not the biblical standard. The biblical standard isn't function. The biblical standard is holiness. Righteousness. In line with scripture. Are you thriving to be a husband who is in line with scripture? Are you striving to be a young man or a young woman who lives their life in line with scripture? Or are we now trying to be pop psychologists and Dr. Fields and Oprah's and people like that and say, yes, and we sound so educated and so smart and so intelligent. Yes, I, I know what's going on with them. They, they are dysfunctional. You, you're dysfunctional. Well, 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 they may be, but uh, uh, until they get right with God. So you can function and still not be right with God. Oh, you don't hear me. See, see the, see the Bible, the Bible is something. That's just why the world has such a problem with biblical Christianity. And they have a problem with preachers like me who dare say things like this. Because we pull you back to where you should be. And, and lift up the standard, the, the godly standard. The standards of biblical Christianity, Christianity, not some pop psychology, some stuff you've picked up watching some of these pseudo uh, psychologists on these uh, talk shows. No, God is calling us to holiness. Is that what the Bible says? They said the law was given to silence the whole world. Therefore, verse 20, therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The, 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 the function of the law was not to justify, but was to show us our error. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. It was manifested when Christ came, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law prophesied that there would come a righteousness which was not of the law. Are you following me? Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of the Lord Jesus Christ upon all and uh, unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference. That is, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. That Jesus equally saves everybody who comes to him and when he saves you, he justifies you. And he justifies us not by acts that we do, but by faith in what he did. Am I making sense? The Bible says, uh, uh, verse 22 says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith. And verse 23 says, for all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. I want to help you with this. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. But all have not come short of the glory of man. We just came short of the glory of God. 
See, when it comes to the glory of man, and men love to glorify, we boast on our own righteousness. We boast on what we've come out of. We boast on what we've accomplished. Glory to God. We, we boast on what we've given up. Look at me. I'm, I'm a good Christian. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't chew. I don't dip. I don't run around. I'm straight. I'm not into all this crazy stuff. That's the glory of man. And you know what? When it comes to the glory of man, you may have dotted every I and crossed every T. You may be, when it comes down to the glory of man, the most righteous, the most pious, the most together person in here. As a matter of fact, you may get all A's when it comes to the glory of man. But all have seen and come short of the glory of God. For with the glory of God, there's a much higher status, much higher standard. In the glory of man, if you do not physically get with that person and have sex with them, that you are not, and you're not married to them, and you don't touch them, you don't sleep with them, you don't get with them, you, are, you get an A. You have passed man's standard. With the glory of God, she can be three states away. But if you think about it and dream about it and lust about it, now it's a higher standard. The Bible said you're guilty. Woo. Oh, they don't like me this morning. There is a standard that is higher than the glory of man so when you look at God's standard you realize that there is truly no righteous person in here there's nobody in here who don't need Jesus who don't need to be saved who don't need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And there's no one saved person in here who have been able to live up to the glory of God. Oh, I'm preaching better than you are saying amen. The glory of God is the standard. See, God's glory reads our mind. He need to hurry up. I'm ready to go. You've sinned to come short of the glory of God. Whereas you might be sitting there smiling like me saying, preach on. God reads your mind. God judges the heart. He has a standard that is way beyond. Oh my, what we demonstrate in public. God knows. So and so is a racist. All of us are. When it comes to God's standard. So and so is a liar. We've all lied. When it comes to God's standard. You can think a lie just quick as tell one. You, you know my point I'm showing you? Is, is, is how wonderful salvation is because of Jesus. Because of what he did. Because of what he did. See, because when, 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 we're going to stand. When we, when we stand before God. We're going to be judged not by the glory of man. We're going to be judged by the glory of God. Praise the Lord. Some of you, you're hurt. And your hurt is not justified. You, you carry grudges. You, got, you have a heart full of resentment and all that stuff. You, you may have on uh, your, your class B. You may have on your habit. You may be on the mother's board. You may be on the deacon's board. You can be the pastor. You can be the bishop. But there is the glory of God. With God's righteous standards, all have failed. All have sinned. I'm going to preach in just a minute. And come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely. Mm. Praise the Lord. This freely means that God grants us justification. Based on what Christ did and not what we've done. 
being justified freely by his grace uh, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God have set forth as uh, set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Propitiation, I won't get in this too deep today, but in the ark of the covenant, the lid of the ark with the cherubims on top where the blood was sprinkled. It was called the mercy seat. That's the propitiation. That was the place where our sins by the high priest on the day of atonement were uh, expiated. Where the debt was paid in full. Blood sprinkled on the mercy seat. Are you praying for me? And once that was done, then God, uh, praise the Lord, forgave the people of all their sins. But that was a problem with that system. The problem was that even though they used the best, even though they used the ones that had no blemish, even though they used the ones that had no spots and no wrinkles. The best, the best, amen, the blood of bulls and goats, even though they were the best, could not take away sin. So when this act was done on the mercy seat, the propitiation, it was done on credit. Because that mercy seat was a type for the real perpetuation who would come in Jesus Christ. And when Christ came, Christ was both the mercy seat being the altar and the blood. So everything is in him. He shed his own blood and he became the mercy seat so that all of our sins could be taken away. My God, somebody ought to thank God for what Jesus did. Oh, I know this don't have anything to do with preaching about houses and cars and money, but let me tell you something. Jesus stepped in and did what we could not do. Hallelujah. He became the sacrifice. He became the mercy seat. He did this for us. Hallelujah. Romans 4 and 25, I feel my help coming, it says this about Jesus who was delivered for our offenses and was raised for our justification. With all that he did, he still had to get up. And when God raised him from the dead, that settled it. And every time a person comes to Jesus Christ to give their heart to the Lord to be saved, the Father looks on what Jesus did. And what Jesus did on the cross 2,020 years ago and the Father raising him from the dead still, praise the Lord, covers all our sins. And it still keeps the Father satisfied. No matter how lost you may be, no matter how sinful you may be, your sin was not as ugly as Christ's perpetuation was beautiful and satisfying to the mind of God. This is why Jesus is our hero, our savior. He's the one who deserves all the praise. Well, I'm a mother in the church. I'm a bishop in the church. I'm the pastor of the church. Thank God, but you wouldn't be anything had Christ not come and became the propitiation, the mercy seat, and the blood. My God today, he did it for us. And then not only does he save us on the outside, but he cleanses us on the inside so that a man don't have to think 
those thoughts that are beneath the glory of God. We serve a God who will clean up your mind. He cleans us from the inside out where we can think pure thoughts and live holy and thank God that we're saved. I want to hear the praises of the justified. Hallelujah. Thank you. So the question is, who are justified? And who is the justified? We are justified. How? How did we get justified? How do you do it, preacher? What do I have to do? What do I have to do? The Bible tells us in Romans 5 and 1, therefore being justified by faith. Woo! Woo! It is so simple that it's hard. And you know why God made it so easy? He wanted to take uh, human boasting out of it. Y'all don't hear me. He wanted to fix it where we got to give all of the praise to Jesus Christ. Back in chapter 3, verse 25, it said, Whom God hath raised, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, that is, uh, in our past, through the forbearance of God. God put up with a system. He put up with a system. Waiting for Jesus to come and to be the real sacrifice. To declare, I say, Paul says, at this time, at this present time, his righteousness. That he might be just and the justifier of him which believe in Jesus. So since God is just and Jesus is the justifier of those of us who believe in Jesus, then verse 27 says, where then, where is boasting then? Uh, it is excluded. In other words, you can't brag off uh, yourself for being saved. You can't boast that I'm this and I'm that and I'm the other. No, no, no. Where is the boasting? The truth is we, we boast in him. And we thank him for saving us and thank him for doing what we could not do. Where is the boasting? It is excluded uh, by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. I'm saved because I believed on Jesus. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Yeah. Is he the God of the Jews only? No. Is he, all, is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. And by the way, there are two groups of people. There are two races on this earth in the eyes of God. Jews and everybody else. Gentiles. Regardless of what color you may be. Seeing then it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith, the Jews got to get saved, they called the circumcision, they got to get saved by faith also. And the uncircumcised, the, the Gentiles, everybody else, through faith in Jesus, since we all got to be circumcised, and uh, I mean, we all got to be saved through Jesus, he says, uh, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yay, we established the law. See, just in case, that's just more like this part. Just in case somebody will interpret, well, that means that when I get saved, I don't have to live anything. I don't have to obey the law. I don't have to do anything. Then does that mean that the law is done away with? No. When you get saved, God gives you power to establish. Yes. Praise the Lord. Y'all ain't saying amen. Now, the standards of God. Yes. Hallelujah. So uh, when you get saved, God gives you the ability to live right and to walk upright for real then. 
So let me, let me try to untangle this rather complicated Sunday morning message. Uh, praise the Lord. Where I can't hardly get an amen. He says, therefore being justified through faith. I'm preaching about the benefits. Benefit number one, we have peace with God. Good God Almighty. Irene, that is, I'm not at war with God. God's not at war with me. I want you to let that sink in. If you're saved today, you have peace with God. Some, some manuscripts read, let us grasp the fact that we have peace with God. You need to realize that you have peace with God. You are at peace. God's at peace with you. See, you don't want the maker of everything to be upset with you. You don't want the one who keeps the sun in the sky, keeps the stars twinkling, keeps every the planets in orbit <laughs> upset with you. Amen. I, I like having friends in high places. And it's wonderful to be at peace with God. A settled peace. A fact of peace. It's peace because of what Christ did. Even when I mess up, he don't get mad with me. I feel bad about it. And thank God that he comes and sets me free. But he, I'm glad that since I've been justified, I've had peace with him ever since. What a wonderful thing to know that we are at peace with God. That God is not angry with us. Those who are sanctified. We have freedom in his presence at all times. We don't have to be afraid to pray. Don't have to be afraid to call on his name. And it doesn't matter who leaves you. Doesn't matter who walk out on you. Doesn't matter who dies. You still have peace with God. And you can still turn to him. And when you turn to him, he won't turn away from you. I'm glad that every time I call him, he hears my cry. I'm glad that I can steal away and get in his arms and feel him wrap me in his arms. I got a question for you, but you got to be honest to answer this one. Have you ever messed up, dropped the ball, and fell short and you felt like God was going to knock you out and you got by yourself and you called on the Lord only to feel God put his arms around you and say I love you my child have you ever been there if you have you ought to tell God thank you we have peace with God and not only do we have peace with God, but benefit number two, we have access by faith. Notice what it says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access. Access is something wonderful. Access is something that you need to know that you have. Access is the right <laughs> granted to someone by some high official, by some monarch. It is the scepter of a king being pointed at you, saying that you have a right to come into my presence and you have a right to make your request in biblical days. If you went before the king and he didn't stretch out his scepter and you started to talk before he gave you the scepter, they would kill you dead because you were out of order and you didn't have a right to say anything. But I'm glad that because of Jesus, I can call him when I need him. Father, Father, up in heaven I can go to God in prayer I can go to God in prayer
Somebody tell him thank you. Access means that you've been introduced to the Father by the Lord Jesus Christ. It means every time, hallelujah, it means every time I hear, God hears my voice. Jesus said to the Father, he is right. You can, you can, you can answer his prayer. You can uh, 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 consider his request because he belongs to me. Jesus is the go-between. Jesus is our mediator. Have anybody in here had a prayer answered lately? Have the Lord heard your prayer? Have the Lord come through for you? Well, that's because God has given us access. Because we've accepted Jesus, we have authority with God the Father. Would you praise the Lord for the access? What do we have access in? We have access into his grace. Now, I just want to say to the saints, no more walking in and out. Either in or out. Because we're having church in here. And, uh, and for those who are streaming, I'm not talking about everybody. And those who are in, they know what I'm talking about. You ain't going in and out. That's that. Praise the Lord. That's that. It throws me off. And I'm trying to preach to you so you can get healed today. There's an order in God's house. Now, I have power to cast the devil out. Somebody say yeah. Thank you, Jesus. So now let me get back to this. We have access into his grace. What is his grace? We have access, somebody ought to shout on this, into God's favor. Access into God's kindness. Access into God's love. Access into God's power. By grace are we saved. Good God Almighty, the Lord told me right here, just speak favor. Favor, 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 favor. You have access into God's favor. Benefit number four, wherein we stand. I want somebody to determine today that you can make your stand in Jesus Christ because he is, he's our rock, he's our keeper, he's our strength. The winds of life, they can blow, but we make our stand in Jesus Christ. The devil can try to knock us down and somebody's going through the day, but I'm here to tell you, stand your ground. God's favor is on the way. Stand your ground. God's blessings on the way. You just got to wait on him. Just believe on him because joy is around the corner. Thank you, Jesus. I stand on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ my King through eternal ages let his praises ring glory to the highest I will shout and sing for I'm standing on the promises of God hallelujah and because I'm standing it gives me power because of his grace because of access because of being justified, because of access, I have a reason to rejoice. That's joy in my heart for benefit. Number five is we rejoice in the glory of God. What is the glory of God? The glory 
is that one day we're going to see Jesus in peace. One day Jesus is coming back. One day he's going to appear and we're going to see him as he is. Hallelujah. One day. Goodbye world. Goodbye world. And hello Jesus. One day we're going to meet our loved ones in the middle of the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. One day the Lord is coming back. The Lord. Oh, one day. Oh, one day. Oh, one day. Oh, one day. Hallelujah. We rejoice every time we think about it. You ought to throw your hands up. You ought to throw your head back and shout glory. Rejoice in the glory of God. Woo! In his glory. In his glory. In his honor. We rejoice. Because we know that Jesus is coming again. But that ain't all. I'm almost done. And that ain't all. We rejoice in. And that's not all. We rejoice in. But there's another benefit. We glory in tribulation. Do I have anybody here who's going through some things? Hallelujah. Look at this Christianity. It gives you power to get excited when you think that Jesus is coming. But not only do we get excited about Jesus coming back, but when life gets hard, when circumstances get tough, when life gets heavy, God gives you power to rejoice anyhow. God gives you power to rejoice even when you're discomforted. The great paradox of Christianity is that joy can coexist with affliction. There are some folk in here today, you're afflicted. Things are not the way you want them to be, but you still have joy. Hey, it's gonna get better after a while, but while I'm waiting for it to get better, I still have my joy. Yeah, do I have any folk who has joy in affliction, joy in sorrow, joy, you may be weak in your body, joy, you're missing your deceased loved one, joy, 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 ah, Lord, it I just want to hear those who are going through afflictions, praise the Lord. If everything is right for you, you can sit this one out. But if there's some affliction, if there's some discomfort, woo, glory in tribulation, glory in tribulation. doesn't matter who you who you are no believer is justified when the joy break out no believer is justified to not give God praise at all when you have it like the Bible said maybe you're not able to run around the walls. Maybe you're not able to break out in a dance. 
Maybe you're not able to do it like you normally do. But if you can't say a word, you're still able to just wave your hands. You're still able to say loud. For being so good, I thank you because in the midst of my heartache, in the midst of my trouble, there's a flame burning on the inside. I still had my joy. shake three people's hand and tell them I still have my joy suffering that don't mean you can't have joy well how do you have joy see joy 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 doesn't come from how you feel joy is the product of what you know it doesn't come from how you feel it comes from what you know he said we glory in tribulation knowing 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 I wonder what do you know about him you can't make me doubt him. Oh, no. Too much about him. Oh. What do you know about Jesus? What do you know about the Lord? 
to know. You got to know that what you're going through, you got to know that the tribulations, you got to know that it's working for you. You got to know it. Pastor, you mean tell me all this and it's working for me? I just lost my mother-in-law, I just lost my granddaddy, I just lost this one, I just lost that. And somehow, I need to know that that is working for me. Yes. I didn't say you need to feel good about it. I said you need to know. He said, knowing this, that tribulation worketh patience. The Bible says in Hebrews 12 and 11, no chastening of the present time seem to be joyous. When you're going, when it's happening to you, it ain't no fun, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. When God gets through working through this when God gets through with this you're going to be better stronger closer to him it's a benefit you got to know this when you know it know this it enables you to rejoice knowing that tribulation worketh patience. I'm getting ready to pray. Hallelujah. This benefit, amen. If this is a benefit for the justified, we got to know that it exists. Tribulation worketh patience. A good word for patience. Look at, look at this. Tribulation worketh perseverance. It gives you the ability to persevere. No person ever develop, develops perseverance in easy times. When, when, when things are going good, when everything is going your way, there's no perseverance. Mm -mm. The perseverance, you know what perseverance is? It develops in you. This is why these mothers, I, you all, all the time, I, I love watching you all through the storms of life. I, I love watching you over the years. I, I enjoy watching the mothers, especially those who are just anchored in Jesus. Because here's what you know is with them. The whole, the rest of the world can be in an uproar, and they're sitting there just as calm. You want to say, well, do they not know what's going on? They know. They know. They know. But you know what they learn? They learn over years of dealing with tribulation that this too will pass. And that uh, you will learn from this. Perseverance teaches steadfastness. See, you're steadfast. You're not up and down, up and down. Some people are so quick, so easy to come and glue. You're sitting there trying to talk to them. You want to slap his hand? Wake up. Come back here. But time and enduring some storms and going through some things teaches you to be steadfast. It's not the end of the world. Tribulation worketh patience. And patience experience. That is, perseverance builds character. Experience character. Character. God knows how. Hallelujah. To reveal what's there that shouldn't be. And to build what should be. He knows how. To build our character. And then 
this, uh, I'm wrapping this up because I want to pray. We've got communion. We're going home. It teaches us. See, when God is building your character, letting things happen, it teaches you. It builds you, but it also teaches all of us things about ourselves. You ever going through something and something came out of your mouth that you didn't think you'd ever say again? I said, Lord, I thought I was delivered from that. Well, yeah. You knock somebody out, you thought fighting was out of your spirit. And bam! Person there, oh my God, I didn't know. He knows how to build us. So it works. But you got to know all this stuff. I didn't say feel. These are benefits that you got to be aware of. And once you're aware of these things, then it, 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 it colors things totally different. Then the last one, it says, an experience character gives us hope. Ah, the character God gives us is like a seal of approval. He watches as, as we hold up and go through tough times as we persevere it gives us hope you know what hope does hope keeps you alive it says a hope hope in Christ hope for a better day hope hope doesn't notice what it says hope make it not ashamed that is hope doesn't disappoint if you hope in God, ultimately, you will not be disappointed. Ultimately, if you hope, even when things don't turn out the way you thought, if you stay with him, you'll see that it turned out in a way that was best, in the way that was best for you. I have expected God to let a thing work out one way, which I thought was ideal. He let it work out another, and I felt some kind of way only to live to see that he let the best thing that could have happened happen for me. He knows what he's doing. And look at this. Look at this. When you put your hope in the Lord, and the missionaries are getting ready, when you put your hope in the Lord, notice what it says. And hope make him not ashamed. And, and I like this. I, I, Dr. Foster, I love, thank God the Lord's touched you. I love this. It says, hope make him not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. This love of God, there is a lot of discussion in the theological community as to whether it is God's love for us or our love for him. You know what it is? When you hope in the Lord and you see the Lord move and you see how God's work works, it gets you to the point where the love of God gets shared abroad. That is, your love for God. Praise the Lord. Your love for God. Your love for for God grows. I love the Lord more today than I loved him when I first met him. When I look on what he's done for me, how he's come through for me, how he's loved me even when I didn't love him, how he's been there through the vicissitudes of life, through the ups and the downs, he has allowed me to experience life, life's hurts, life's pains, life disappointments, just like everyone else. But what he's done is, he's loved me through it in such a way and comforted me in such a way that it makes me love him that much more. I wouldn't have survived, Lord, had it not been you. So you love him so that you don't even see how people, others, could not love him. Because that love for God 
is shared abroad in your heart. Who wouldn't love a God who's there on rainy days just like he is on sunshiny days? Who wouldn't love a God who is just as present when a new baby, a grandchild is being born into the world, he's just as present as when a loved one has just passed away. Who would not love a God? See, because when you think about what the Lord has done and our hope in him and how he takes our lives and does the things that he do with them, you can't help. But love him. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. These are the benefits of the justified. And there are many, many more. You better know that Christ is with you. You need to know that you have access to him. When I ask you all to be ready, uh, Sister Mose, y'all getting ahead of me now. Too much moving. Y'all get in one place and stop. Y'all go ahead, finish. I didn't expect all this. I, I started seeing all this moving around. I said, Lord, because I don't, yeah, stop. I haven't read the uh, communion scriptures yet. I said, get ready. I didn't say commence. They started passing that communion. Wait. Amen. You don't do that. Amen. Ain't no harm is meant, but wait a minute. Because I need to pray before y'all get this communion. <laughs> he loves us. He loves you. He loves me. He's working through life's experiences. Don't get bitter with him. Mm -mm. Just know that your tribulation is working on your behalf. And the trait that comes out of that will create another one. And so forth and so on. I love him. Because he first loved me. I believe that love is talking about our love for God because verse 6 then begins to tell us about his love for us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for us. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet preadventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Don't you love him? I'm not saved because I have to be. I mean, I have to be if I'm going to go to heaven. But that's not why I'm in the church. It's not why I'm saved. I'm saved because I love the Lord. I didn't love him when I got saved. I didn't know him. But once he came into my heart, and then I began to realize it changed everything. I developed an affection for the Lord that is unparalleled. And so have you. If the Lord have justified you, you've accepted Jesus, and you know that you're justified, lift your hands to him now. Dear Lord Jesus, great justifier, great God who've given us all of, the, all of these benefits, great Savior who have made a way, great, great God. We thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for every door that you've opened. 
and thank you for every way that you have made. You are the justifier. We are the justified. And we thank you. We love you. And Lord, as we matriculate through this life, help us to keep in mind all of these benefits that we have unfettered access to you no matter where we are what's going on we have access into your favor wherein wherein we stand in the name of Jesus and we glory in your coming Mm. But that ain't all that we glory in. We glory in tribulation. Knowing that the tribulation is working on our behalf. Giving us perseverance. Perseverance is giving us character. And character is filling us with hope. A man can't live without hope. Man can't function without hope. And thank you for being the object of our hope. You never fail. And we thank you. Now, Lord, forgive us of our sins. Even though we're justified, stamp justified, there are yet practical areas that we need to come up in. And Father, we don't want anything to interfere with our ability to participate in the Holy Communion in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name.